completed his fellowship in pediatric pulmonology last year and has joined faculty. He's helped author over, uh, seven peer-reviewed publications and presented over a dozen abstracts at national and international meetings. He is a member of the AAP, Ameri American College of Chess Physicians and American Thoracic Society, as well as he serves on the COSAIR Asthma Task Force and is going to be talking a little bit about uh, personalized medicine in the treatment of severe asthmatics today. Thank you all so much. Um, it's really an honor. I've been sitting on that side of the microphone for, for many, many uh, years, and so it's really an honor to have the opportunity to present today at Grand Rounds. Um, thank you all for coming out. This is an area where there's been a lot of research and developments over the past uh, number of years, and so I'm happy to get to share some of that data with you today. Um, to start out, for better or for worse, I have no relevant disclosures. Um, Today, I hope that we're going to be able to characterize severe asthma, um, particularly in the pediatric population, um, and discuss strategies to attain control. Um, and some of these strategies will be based off of unique phenotypic fe uh, features in our patients. Um, and then, you know, I hope to be able to explore a little bit of the roles of some um, newer therapies that are not, that may not quite yet be incorporated into the guidelines that we're used to seeing. Um, and so, you know, where we stand right now is we have several sets of guidelines to help provide evidence-based recommendations on asthma care. I think most of us are familiar with the um, NHLBI expert uh, panel report three that's now nine years old. Um, but the Global Initiative for Asthma uh, released just this past year a new set of guidelines. And a joint, recommend, a, a, a joint task force uh, released guidelines specific to severe asthma um, by the uh, European Respiratory Society and American Thoracic Society in 2014. Well, how did we get here? So that, that's kind of, you know, where we stand today. So um, let's take a look back at the past. Um, so the word asthma comes from the Greek azine, uh, which is a verb to exhale with mouth open or to pant. And the, the word was first used in Homer's Iliad, but it was first used in a medical context by Hippocrates and his colleagues. Um, around 400 BC. And at that time, it was more um, of a descriptive word. It was more of a, a symptom. It really didn't reflect the clinical entity that we think of today. So we fast forward to um, 1698, and Sir John Floyer, who was a British physician, who interestingly was probably most known for popularizing um, taking the pulse of patients. He uh, developed a uh, watch to do this, but he also wrote extensively on asthma. He he um, suffered from it uh, pretty severely himself. And he recognized, um, even at that time, that treatment was required both in and out of a fit. And so you have acute therapies to help you um, for an acute exacerbation, and then controller therapies to hopefully help minimize symptoms and uh, reduce the frequency of those. He also recognized that asthma was, very, uh, was multifactorial in nature, that it um, had hereditary components, um, uh, depended on um, environmental exposures, pollution, infection, um, exercise, and even uh, psychosocial influences. So um, fast forwarding about 200 years, Sir Thomas Granger Stewart and George Alexander Gibson um, wrote extensively again on asthma in um, Sedman's 20th century practice. And I'm not going to read this, um, but you can see that a lot of the um, axioms that they use in, in the um, uh, relating to the care of asthma are principles that are still embodied in today's modern guidelines. Now, the treatments of the time were, were a little different than what I'll be talking about today. Particularly, I have not prescribed asthma cigarettes in, uh, in, in quite some time. Um, but the interesting thing is these powders and cigarettes that they used a lot around the turn of the century um, contain stramonium, which... Um, uh, it, it, which has um, alkaloids of belladonna, which is an anticholinergic. Um, and so these were, you know, these had similar properties to modern therapies such as atrovent and teotropium um, that, that we use today. In 1910, a case series was published in The Lancet um, that described the use of epinephrine in, in the acute uh, therapy uh, for asthma. And that's a medication that we still use today in the ED in certain situations. And then a lot of the literature around this time um, it espoused drinking lots of coffee in asthmatics, which is interesting because coffee is metabolized um, in a small uh, form, about 4% to theophylline. 
So in the mid 20th century, we start to see modern MDIs being developed um, with beta agonists and epinephrine. The beta agonists were typically um, nonspecific, um, things like isoproteranol that had much um, higher side effect uh, profile than the um, selective beta 2 agonists that we use today. Um, you saw the development of systemic corticosteroids and inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and theophylline was also in use quite a bit around this time. Um, so we, we get into the late 20th century, and we have the first um, expert panel report, uh, which provided, again, evidence-based guidelines for asthma. And really, the key takeaway from that, because at this time the regimens to control asthma varied significantly, was that um, daily inhaled corticosteroids is the optimal long-term management for persistent asthma. And that's something that persists to this day and probably will continue pers to persist for quite some time. Um, so these are the most recent guidelines, as I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Um, again, issued about nine years ago. And we've seen this chart before many times, um, looking at the step-up therapy. This one in particular is for 12 years and up. And you can see that um, you know, there's some medications listed um, that we, we don't really use a lot today, chromalin, uh, xylutin, things of that nature. And if you look, you know, the guidelines don't really, or at least this chart doesn't really break down treatment based upon specific uh, patient phenotypes. The only sort of you know, personalized or specialized therapy is that it makes brief mention of immunotherapy for um, steps two to four as a potential therapy for those with allergic asthma. Um, and so you know, now we've had guidelines in place for 25 years. And yet, if you look at data you know, in terms of emergency department um, utilization, acute utilization, admissions, you know, we've kind of plateaued. There's not been a lot of change over the past, you know, um, uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, there has been some slight decline in mortality. So it's led people to ask the question, is guideline-based management effective? And so if you look at studies, this one in particular was done in, uh, published in 2008. And the goal of the study was actually to see um, how exhaled nitric oxide um, played a role in the management of um, adolescents with asthma. These were inner-city inner adolescents, um, many of them moderate and severe, um, many of them uncontrolled. Um, and you can see that as soon as they're enrolled in this study during the run-in period where they're monitored and where their adherence um, is uh, improved and they start on guideline-based therapy, you see a dramatic decrease in their number of days with symptoms and a um, rise in their FEV1. Um, and in fact, there was no change between the exhaled nitric oxide group and the uh, control group, except the exhaled nitric oxide group wound up being on more inhaled corticosteroids. Um, but, um, but if you look at this, you know, 20% have suboptimal control at any given time, and about 40% will have suboptimal control for at least a short period of time. Let's transition now and look at some of the definitions of severe asthma that exist. Again, I think the one that we're most familiar with um, are those in the NHLBI guidelines um, that specify that for severe asthma, the patient must have um, pretty severe symptoms. Um, daily, um, using um, short-acting beta agonists several times a day. And if you look at the lung function, they specify a, a baseline FEV1 of less than 60%. Um, which many of our patients, even those who are in and out of the hospital quite a bit, you know, don't quite meet that threshold, at least in terms of lung function. And so, you know, I would, I would propose that, um, that this is a very strict uh, uh, definition for severe asthma. Now, the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society uh, released their own um, definition, which is a little different. And it specifies that severe asthma is that which requires treatment with high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and some other controller, whether it be a long-acting beta agonist, uh, Montelukast, theophylline, some other controller, or those that require systemic corticosteroids for 50% of the previous year um, to attain control. Um, and, um, and you can see they define uncontrolled asthma there. And their airflow limitations, their FEV1 limit is 80%. And so, you know, a greater proportion of patients would probably be defined as having severe asthma under this um, definition. Another term that you see in the literature quite a bit is this problematic severe asthma. And it represents about, you know, again, these probably encompass about 5 to 10 percent of patients with asthma. And many authors break this down into difficult to treat asthma, which we'll talk about, and se um, uh, severe therapy-resistant asthma. 
probably in pediatrics, the proportion of patients who are truly therapy resistant is relatively low. Um, and it's estimated there, that there is about 315,000 patients with this problematic severe asthma in the United States, um, which is about the uh, um, equivalent of three Ohio stadiums worth. And if you've been there, it's a cavernous place. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really hoping to see U of L and Ohio State square off in the playoffs in a few months. That'll be very interesting. Um, changing, uh, changing gears a little bit. So near fatal asthma is another obviously um, very detrimental thing. And I guess what I want to get across, there's, there's a couple definitions that different authors use. Um, some define near fatal asthma as um, just being admitted to the ICU um, or being admitted to the ICU. Whereas others define it as um, patients who need uh, ventilation, whether it be non-invasive or um, invasive ventilation. Um, there's about 200 pediatric uh, deaths from asthma per year. Um, but uh, those who have a near-fatal asthma event um, are at very high risk for future morbidity and mortality. And I think one point I want to get across is that while we talk a lot today about severe asthma, um, if you look, this is uh, single center data from a ICU um, in the Northeast over about 10 years. You know, the um, classification of patients who have had near fatal asthma events really is across the board. I mean, you have, um, and this is, these are raw numbers and not percentages, um, but you have uh, patients, you know, in all categories experiencing these very severe events. I think that's something we need to impress upon our patients and make sure that they're aware of just the fact that they're mild persistent does not mean that they may not be at risk for a very severe exacerbation. Um, some of the clinical hallmarks of disease that you see is, um, you know, this very severe air trapping, hyperinflation on x-ray, um, uh, uh, flattening of the diaphragm, and markedly um, widened AP diameter. Um, and this is reflected in um, when you do spirometry and uh, lung volumes. You see um, obstruction on your spirometry, and you see marked elevation in your residual volume, which is, again, consistent with the x-ray we saw. Um, and these patients, um, again, are at, are at uh, increased risk. The other thing we see a lot in patients with severe asthma, um, this was a, um, looking at uh, SARP data, so Severe Asthma Research Program. It's an NH NHLBI program looking at children and adults um, with severe asthma. Um, you see a, a high degree of um, allergic sensitization. Um, these patients, um, there's a lot of overlap, um, but severe patients tended to have higher um, blood eosinophils and higher serum IgE levels, um, and then higher levels of um, sensitization to mold, indoor out, um, aeroallergens, and pollens. On um, histology, you see obstruction of the lumen uh, with kind of this mucoid exudate. You see goblet cell hyperplasia, basement membrane thickening, and inflammation of the bronchioles. And in the rare cases of fatal asthma, at autopsy, you see this diffuse, severe mucus plugging in the large airways, which really causes asphyxia. And so it's important to keep that mechanism in mind as we discuss severe asthma. Um, so at this time, I'd like to talk just briefly about the evaluation of these patients um, and um, several key questions that need to be addressed. Um, and many of these I think you guys are familiar with, but it's, it's, it's probably good to review. I think any time you have a patient who is on high-dose um, corticosteroids, inhaled corticosteroids, multiple controllers, and are not responding, one of the key questions has to be, is it really asthma? Um, and so certainly, you know, a lot of these other um, entities can masquerade as asthma. And a lot of these can be differentiated with just a very, very good history. Um, I don't suggest just shotgunning um, to, to try and um, uh, differentiate these, um, but a very good history, and then a chest x-ray and PFTs um, in patients who are able to do it really will help to make the diagnosis more clear. Uh, most four-year-olds are very good at blowing out candles like my daughter is, and so they can be incentivized to um, do spirometry. And we can do impulse oscillometry to look for um, bronchial hyperreactivity in patients as, as low as three, or in the case of my daughter, as young as two. Um, most two-year-olds can't do that. My, mine just happens to be uh, advanced, I guess. Um, it's, anyways, um, 
So, you know, problematic severe asthma, again, breaking it into difficult to treat asthma and um, severe therapy resistant asthma. And so, you really want to evaluate in, in your difficult to treat cases once you've established that the diagnosis is asthma. You know, are there comorbid conditions? So, we talked about a lot of these patients have severe allergic sensitization, um, they might have sinusitis, reflux tends to be high in certain clusters of these patients. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, um, uncontrolled OSA can um, um, make asthma very difficult to control and is something we should evaluate for. Um, and then, you know, I said that the number one question is, is it asthma? The number two question, or maybe a tie for that, is, is the family adherent to their treatment plan? I think this tends to be a major issue that we um, run into. Um, and so, um, looking at the patient's you know, insurance type, their fill history, socioeconomic factors that may be contributing, I think is essential in these patients. The New York Times um, had a, ran a series of articles about three years ago talking about the high cost of um, medicines, not just in asthma, but in other conditions. And this is certainly uh, pertinent today with the EpiPen controversy. Um, I'm going to ignore the fact that this teenager is not using a spacer with her um, um, Ventolin, but, um, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, but, you know, they were talking about the fact that, you know, if you look at what we pay for inhaled medications, such as QVAR, it is dramatically more expensive than in other countries. Two, Q, two QVAR inhalers in the United States, on average, cost the same as 37 inhalers in Greece. And this is an issue that we see in our clinic all the time. Um, we actually just recently published some data from our clinic um, that demonstrated um, that patients with private insurance uh, at least in our clinic, we're filling their inhaled corticosteroid or their inhaled asthma medications at a statistically significant lower rate than those with public insurances. So in other words, those with passport and Medicaid and so on had a significantly higher fill rate than those with private insurance. Um, and we speculate that that's because of the cost. Anecdotally, we have patients coming to us telling, you know, who have high deductible plans who are telling us that it's costing them to $300 per month to fill their inhaled corticosteroid. And so um, this obviously presents us a significant issue. Um, now, interestingly, you know, the same, this, the same data we looked at showed that those with um, private insurance were much more likely to come back to our office, whereas those with public health, care, or public health insurance um, tended not to follow up as well. So, so there might be different barriers for each group that we need to address. I think, you know, um, to, in order to kind of individualize treatment, we have to be able to characterize asthma. Um, we know that it's a, a heterogeneous disorder. Um, we've talked about whether or not the guidelines treat it as such. Um, but there was an editorial in The Lancet in 2006 that talked about, that suggested that asthma by itself is a, is a fairly nonspecific and, and maybe somewhat outdated term. They, they compared it to calling arthritis a disease in and of itself as, a, as, um, as compared to a, a symptom of a specific disorder. And so now we've kind of gone all the way back to the Greeks who were using asthma as a, as, as, as a symptom as opposed to a uh, you know, specific condition. Um, there's a lot that goes into characterizing phenotypes. Um, and certainly a lot of work has been done looking at the genetics of asthma. And it's a, it's a pretty complex picture. Um, epigenetics in the environment probably play a very significant role in a lot of these patients. And, um, and so this is something that is continuing to be characterized, um, not just with genetics, but by specific types of inflammation, um, uh, lung function, and so on. Looking at phenotypes historically, we've tended to look more at clinical phenotypes. So the classic type 1 versus type 2 asthmatic, the type 1 kind of having a gradual onset, and the type 2 having, being this very brittle patient um, that, be, that can become sick very quick. Um, and it's been suggested would benefit from things like EpiPens themselves. Um, the trend over the past decade has been to do things such as um, cluster analysis. So cluster analysis is an unsupervised analytic approach uh, that helps to distinguish complex phenotypes in an unbiased manner. So you take a number of um, specific characteristics run them through this algorithm, and you get these um, specific differentiated groups. This has been done in the adult population. They've identified five phenotypes that have been um, replicated in several studies. And you see differences in age of onset, uh, neutrophilic versus eosinophilic inflammation, lung function, and so on. 
<clears throat> in pediatrics, a uh, cluster analysis was um, published in 2011 looking at patients in the um, SARP database, that Severe Asthma Research Program. And they were able to differentiate four clusters based on 12 specific variables, such as age of onset, lung function, et cetera. There were three main variables that were able to discriminate between these groups, and that was duration of diagnosis, number of controllers, and FEV1. Um, and so just briefly looking at these clusters, um, cluster one all, all, by the way, had some level of ATP. Cluster one had relatively minor ATP and was a relatively um, less severe group than the others, but even so, 88% had had an exacerbation in the past year. Um, cluster two was the most atopic uh, group, and both of these had normal lung function. These accounted, the two, these two clusters accounted for about 60% of patients, and then 20% um, for cluster three and cluster four individually. Um, cluster three patients had lots of um, comorbid conditions, so high rates of GERD, sinusitis, recurrent pneumonias, things of that nature. 41% um, had been in the past year, and over half were using their um, short-acting beta agonists daily. And then finally, cluster four patients are these patients that I think we see a whole lot in the hospital and in the clinic um, and so on. They have advanced airflow impairment almost any time you do spirometry. They're very atopic. They've had asthma their whole life. And if you look, almost half of them were admitted in the past year. Almost 100% had had an exacerbation, and over a quarter of them had been in the PICU. Most of these patients are on three controllers, and um, I think they're the patients that we tend to, you know, wonder if they're doing their medications um, uh, as much as we'd like them to. And in many situations, the, the family cells that, you know, or seem to indicate that, yes, they are. And even without that, or even with that being so, it's hard to get them under control. You can see that uh, these, um, these clusters here really do not correlate all that well with the um, criteria that we've set forth to differentiate between mild, moderate, and severe asthma. And so it's, it's going to be interesting going forward to see, to see what sort of modifications, if any, are made to try and um, help these overlap a bit more. Um, so this raises, um, so these studies raise potential phenotypic targets um, that might be helpful in the um, treatment of asthma. And I'm going to spend the, the next half of the talk kind of talking about some of these um, newer therapies. Um, some of these targets include patients with go. Severe allergic asthma uh, characterized by high IgE, high pheno, um, uh, fractional exhaled nitric oxide, um, and blood and sputum eosinophils. Um, eosinophilic asthma, again with high eosinophils, recurrent exacerbations, high pheno. Uh, neutrophilic asthma, which is less common in the pediatric population, um, are typically uh, uh, characterized by corticosteroid insensitivity. Um, and then some of these others here you can see, again, are probably a little less common in the pediatric population. Okay. So we're going to um, proceed to some of the targeted therapies um, or some of the newer therapies um, in asthma. And we're going to start with um, one that's actually been around for a while, and that is low-dose theophylin. So theophylin's been used for a long time now. It's been used historically as a bronchodilator. It historically is used in relatively high doses to achieve that bronchodi um, um, bronchodilation. And at those doses, it has a very narrow therapeutic window. It has lots of side effects. It requires monitoring. And so because of that, it's largely fallen out of favor. Over the past 10 to 20 years or so, there's been a renewed interest in theophylin at much lower doses, so at about you know, 5 to 7 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Um, and at these doses, it's safer, the side effect profile seems much better, and there's less of a need for monitoring. Um, it uh, has been postulated to restore steroid responsiveness, particularly in patients with smoke exposure. Um, it's used in chronic management, and it may even have a role in acute asthma care. Um, I'm going to briefly touch upon the mechanism. Um, so corticosteroids are reliant upon histone deacetylase 2, this HDAC2 right here, um, to, um, to deactivate or to switch off the inflammatory genes um, and, and have the effect that we want it to have. Um, well, in situations where you have a lot of oxidative stress, so if you have um, a lot of smoke, ex uh, uh, smoke exposure or air pollution or so on, um, 
you have this uh, phospho inositide uh, pathway that gets activated, and that pathway deactivates HDAC2. Well, theophylline works through that pathway and reverses that uh, such that it restores HDAC2 levels and restores corticosteroid uh, um, sensitivity. Now, it had been thought for a long time that this was mainly a problem for adults. So we knew that uh, adults with COPD, severe asthma, especially those who smoked, had low HDAC levels and were going to be most likely, you know, maybe the best candidates to respond to this therapy. Um, but in 2014, a uh, article was released or published in Chess that showed that, uh, that children with severe asthma um, who have passive smoke exposure have significantly lower um, HDAC2 levels compared to their non-smoke uh, um, uh, exposed peers. And so, I mean, we see this all the time clinically that for multiple reasons, those with smoke exposure have worse disease. Um, but this, this provides maybe a uh, mechanism that we can help address, in addition, obviously, to trying to minimize and eliminate the smoke exposure in the first place. Um, now, how does this translate clinically? So this is an adult study um, that was released 20 years ago, uh, close to 20 years ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at um, low-dose theophylline with budesonide. And so they looked at low-dose budesonide plus theophylline and high-dose budesonide by itself and found that those um, on low-dose budesonide with theophylline had um, st statistically significant uh, improvements um, in their FVC and FEV1. A larger study that was done about three years ago in China um, found that um, patients who were randomized to um, an ICS and LABA plus placebo versus ICS LABA versus, uh, um, with the addition of theophylline had a much lower rate of exacerbations. And interestingly, had um, the theophylline group had a, a statistically significant improvement over the placebo group in their small airway function. Um, these patients were all non-smokers. So this, you know, now I'm not sure where this was done, if there's lots of smoke exposure perhaps. They do tend to use theophylline in China quite a bit as it's a very, uh, very um, low-cost medication. So it, it tends to have a lot of utility in, in places where um, maybe there's, there's not as many resources available. Um, but regardless, it seemed to have a positive impact on exacerbations. <clears throat> so um, Dr. E has long been a proponent of using low-dose theophylline um, in the inpatient setting in patients who seem not to be responding to uh, corticosteroid therapy, so patients who have stayed longer in the hospital than the average length of stay. And so we retrospectively went back and looked at these patients um, at about 55 patients who received theophylline and um, tried to match them with 100 control patients. It was a retrospective study. But after adjusting for severity measures, low-dose theophylline appeared to decrease costs and decrease length of stay. Now, this needs to be confirmed with a you know, placebo-controlled, um, uh, double-blinded uh, prospective study. But it's, but it's interesting um, uh, to speculate upon. And it may be something that we can use in the hospital to help these patients who seem to be stuck. So where does theophylline fit in? Well, it may be good for chronic use in patients um, who are poorly controlled despite multiple controllers. Maybe these cluster four patients who, despite multiple therapies, you know, still have low lung function and still have uh, persistent symptoms. Um, it's probably helpful in patients with significant smoke exposure, or maybe even patients who live in these areas of town that are plagued by, uh, by air pollution, as we've seen in some of the studies locally that have been um, done. Um, it might be helpful in acute severe asthma exacerbations that don't seem to be responding to standard therapy. Um, but I think we still need a lot, uh, we still need further data in pediatric patients clearly to um, completely understand the role of where this fits. So the next medication I want to talk about is macrolides. So macrolides, I think we all know, um, are a broad spectrum antimicrobial um, they inhibit bacterial protein synthesis through interactions with the 23, 23S ribosomal RNA. Um, they include 14-member and 15-member um, antibiotics, including erythromycin, clarithromycin, and azithromycin. 
And there's been a lot of interest in using the anti-inflammatory properties of these medications in asthma and other lung diseases. Um, specifically, you know, macrolides have been noted to inhibit biofilm production, um, to enhance innate immunity, decrease IL-8, and have anti-neutrophilic properties, um, and to inhibit the production and secretion of some cytokines. And you can see here, you know, um, some other effects are that you get improved um, tight junctions. Um, you get beneficial effects on the um, epithelial barrier integrity. Um, and so all of these things, you get um, anti-mucin um, properties. So you see goblet cell hyperplasia uh, improve on my, uh, macrolide therapy. And so all of these mechanisms have, have led people to speculate that this might be a helpful therapy in asthma. So the um, as, as a stat study, the azithromycin and severe asthma study um, looked at adults who were um, on step four or five therapy and who never smoked. And when you look at all comers, there was really no change in the rate of exacerbations. Now, when you looked at non-eosinophilic severe asthma, there was a um, significant um, trend in, or a significant improvement in the rate of exacerbations. Um, I think we need to keep in mind for pediatrics that you know, neutrophilic asthma in pediatrics looking at studies tends to be pretty uncommon. Um, and even in the adult world, I think we're looking for more data um, before just prescribing low dose azithromycin to everyone. And, and the, the regimen here was um, low dose azithromycin, such as like Monday, Wednesday, Friday dosing. Um, there is a study that was actually, it was just, it's been in the news over the past week. Um, this was the Azalea trial, or the Azithromycin Against Placebo and Exacerbations of Asthma trial. It was conducted in the UK, and they randomized 199 patients with acute asthma exacerbations to placebo versus azithromycin. Um, and what they found was is that there was no difference in symptom scores or lung function. One of the big take-home points, um, as I look at Dr. Marshall sitting there in the center, was that when they went to try and randomize these patients, for every patient they're able to randomize, more than 10 had to be excluded because they had already been put on antimicrobials. So, you know, maybe we don't want to use antimicrobial therapy that frequently for asthma unless there is a clear bacterial um, source that needs to be treated. Um, and a Cochrane review confirms this, um, this approach. So they looked at um, a number of different studies looking at prevention of exacerbations. Um, the circled one is the only one that included pediatric patients, but there was no benefit to azithromycin in preventing exacerbations. Um, likewise, there was really no significant effect on FEV1. Maybe the very slightest of trends towards um, macrolide usage, um, but, but nothing that I think would change clinical therapy or um, clinical recommendations. So when we're discussing macrolides, there's really no clear evidence for the routine use, um, either as an acute or chronic therapy, unless obviously you have a clear bacterial you know, source that you're treating um, where it would be appropriate. Um, further study may still be needed, particularly in those with neutrophilic asthma. Um, but the, you know, the ESR and ATS guidelines suggest that clinicians do not use macrolide antibiotics in adults and children um, for the treatment of severe asthma. So we'll move on to mus uh, muscarinic antagonists. And so now I have on the screen two different llamas. The llama you see at the petting zoo and the llama that may be useful in um, helping to control asthma. Um, so teotropium is a um, long-acting muscarinic antagonist. It's a bronchodilator that has been used for a long time in COPD. And there's been interest in using it in asthma for some time. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, teotropium works by binding to the um, M3 muscarinic uh, receptor. Therefore, it prevents the activation of this pathway um, that inevitably leads to bronchoconstriction. Um, and so it was just recently approved for asthma in September of 2015, so just about a year ago for ages 12 and up. It has a standard dose, um, about 2.5, well, 2.5 micrograms per day. Um, it's once daily administration, so it should be fairly easy to adhere to. And, um, and you can see in these studies that, uh, that patients had a significant improvement in their FEV1 um, compared to placebo. 
and that patients on teotropium um, had about a 21% reduction in exacerbations and, a, and were 68% more likely to have uh, to report improved um, symptoms of, um, of asthma. So again, predominantly this is adult data. There was a case series in pediatrics of 71 patients published a couple years ago. And uh, this group identified several subsets where they proposed that teotropium may be helpful. Uh, particularly patients whom you're trying to get off certain medications. So certain patients are going to be in, uh, uh, going to have issues with high dose inhaled corticosteroids. Maybe they have growth concerns. Maybe there's thrush. Um, some people will report behavioral problems. Um, in these patients, um, adding a long-acting um, muscarinic antagonist like teotropium may be beneficial in helping to reduce your need for ICS. Likewise, um, for patients who are concerned about the black box warning on LABAs or who have contraindic specific contraindications for LABAs, um, may find this a useful alternative. Um, this group also found that teotropium was useful in patients whose symptoms were characterized by uh, um, chronic cough or, or persistent cough. Um, and so about 60% showed clinical improvements. And again, 41% were able to decrease the dose of their ICS or eliminate their LABA. Um, so there is um, phase two. We're currently in phase two uh, um, uh, uh, range dosing studies. This was published in 2015. And basically, it was looking at six to 11-year-olds and showed that teotropium was efficacious. It was well tolerated. And it did result in improvements both in the peak and trough um, FEV1. So where does it fit? So it might work as an add-on therapy for those remaining poorly controlled despite um, in high dose inhaled corticosteroids, LABA, um, things like Montelukast. You may be able to reduce the medication burden, especially in patients who are experiencing side effects with other types of medications. Um, patients where cough is a predominant symptom um, may be helped by this, um, but certainly further study is, will be needed in the pediatric population, and hopefully that data will be coming out um, in the next several years. So now I want to turn, um, turn your attention to something that you see a lot, I think, in the medical press um, in terms of being the next, you know, the next big thing in asthma therapy. So these um, humanized monoclonal antibodies. Um, so looking at the Th2 pathway, there are several key targets um, for, uh, for intervention. I think the one that um, we might be familiar with that's been out since 2003 is amelizumab, or anti-IgE. Um, where you basically inhibit the mast cell, where you block IgE and then inhibit the mast cell from releasing histamine and prostaglandins. Um, but other proposed targets are anti-IL-5 that has anti-eosinophilic properties, um, and anti-IL-4 and 13, um, which block uh, the B cell pathway, um, which would then go on to block IgE and so on. So um, anti-IgE has, um, again, been approved in uh, 2003. It was just recently approved in July 2016 for ages 6 to 11. So it's now a option for patients, uh, for almost all our pediatric patients in the school age population and above. Um, the dosing is based on total IgE and the patient's weight. Um, and it's dosed every two to four weeks, and it's a subcutaneous injection. I think you know, some of the most compelling data with amelizumab comes from a study that was published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. They had 419 participants who underwent randomization. Um, about three-fourths, about 73% had moderate or severe disease. Um, and what they found was that compared to placebo, um, the amelizumab group um, had about a 25% reduction in their days with symptoms. They reduced exacerbations by about 38%. And there was a 75% reduction in hospitalization. Uh, it also tended to um, these peaks right here that you see these seasonal peaks were smoothed out in the amelizumab group. So we all know about the September peak that we see right as school starts. Um, and you did not tend to see this. And so these patients in this study were inner city adolescent patients um, with, with, again, a significant burden of disease um, who are many of what we tend to think of as our frequent flyers, both you know, in the hospital and in the clinics. And so this is you know, potentially compelling, compelling data. 
Um, one of the concerns with amilizumab was that early on there was um, thoughts that maybe those on amilizumab had higher rates of malignancy. And so I think when you're counseling patients and you raise the you know, specter of malignancy being a potential long-term side effect, that always um, uh, you know, creates apprehension and fear. Um, the Excels trial uh, followed 5,000 patients on amilizumab over five years. Um, and did not find any difference um, compared to those not on amilizumab um, in malignancy rates. And so this at least is suggestive that, um, that, that amilizumab tends to be fairly safe. The main side effects tend to be localized reactions um, at the injection site, and then you have to be careful about anaphylaxis. So these patients, especially the first time or so that they get it, need to be watched very closely in the office. So mepolizumab is an anti-IL-5 um, that was approved in 2015 for patients 12 and above. Um, a very similar molecule, resolizumab, was approved uh, for ages 18 and up just this past March. Um, and these both act on the IL-5 molecule itself. Um, ben Benrolizumab is, a phase, is currently in phase three studies, that, and that acts on a receptor on the eosinophil itself. Um, essentially neutralizes the eosinophil and um, induces apoptosis. So the initial trials on mepolizumab um, really did not show any improvement in exacerbations or um, clinical outcomes. However, when patients were stratified um, based on sputum eosinophilia, um, exhaled nitric oxide, blood eosinophils, um, there, was, uh, there were significant changes demonstrated. This was the DREAM study um, the dose ranging efficacy and safety in mazalizumab in severe asthma trial. Um, and it found a 48% reduction in exacerbations, um, really in, um, in all doses of mepolizumab from 75 to 750 milligrams. Um, and so based on this in subsequent trials, um, mep uh, mepolizumab wound up being approved, but again, only for these subset of patients with eosinophilic asthma. Interestingly, it's approved in um, ages 12 and up, but in the studies, there were all of 28 patients who were adolescents in that you know, 12 to 17 category who were in any of the studies. Um, it was interesting because the FDA advisory committee actually recommended against approval um, in, that, in that adolescent age range, um, but the FDA, several months later, went ahead and approved it for 12 and up for reasons that are not in entirely clear. Um, certainly more data is needed in these age groups to, um, before we incorporate this widely in practice. Um, Fenrolizumab, again, is, um, is, this recept is the receptor in, um, antagonist um, that does show some improvements in lung function um, in properly selected patients, patients um, who have eosinophilia, um, and then had some decreases um, in the rates of exacerbations both in patients with and without um, marked eosinophilia. So moving on to the last set of, um, of these biologic agents, um, lebricizumab um, is an anti-IL-4 um, that failed its primary endpoint in one of two phase three studies just this past February. Um, and so it's kind of waiting to be seen you know, where that goes from here. Uh, Trilucanumab uh, is in phase 2B trials. Um, However, or, or the phase 2B study showed no reduction in exacerbation rates, um, but did show some increase in FDV1, and phase 3 trials are ongoing. And then um, dupilumab um, had a phase 2B study that, again, just encompassed um, patients 18 and up um, that showed positive results in terms of exacerbations and lung function, irrespective of the eosinophil count. So it'll be interesting to see where, where these go. So where do these biologic agents fit into our management? Well, amilizumab has, again, been around since 2003. Um, we tend not to have that many patients on it in our clinic, but it can be used, you know, for severe treatment refractory allergic asthma. Um, potentially, mepolizumab will, will play a role in this um, in patients with refractory eosinophilic asthma, maybe those who have fil failed amilizumab. Um, but I think we need to keep in mind that these are very expensive therapies. They're time-consuming for the family. They do have risks of anaphylaxis. Um, the cost for one year's treatment of amilizumab is about $35,000. 
And so if you are preventing multiple hospital admissions and uh, preventing morbidity and mortality, maybe that's worth it. Um, but um, but um, I think for most patients, we can control their symptoms with strict guideline-based therapy. Um, and again, the role in pediatric therapy for these biologics is still, still being determined. Um, now, there is a, there's one other uh, class of medication that has just, there's been some new data on it over the past year. Um, Fivipiprint is a new asthma pill. It was out in the news as this groundbreaking medication. And this was actually a fairly small trial of about 61 patients, 18 and older. Um, but it did show reduction in um, eosinophil counts um, that then, you know, once you withdrew the medication, um, resumed. So if we are looking at some of the data with these biologics that reducing or neutralizing eosinophils is useful in certain patients in preventing exacerbations, this might be a less invasive way of um, accomplishing that goal. Um, but again, we're quite a far ways out from this coming to, to your clinic. So now we've reviewed all these, um, you know, new therapies that are kind of beyond, you know, many of the typical things that we use in our clinic. So where does it fit? Well, the um, Global Initiative for Asthma, as I referenced earlier, released its international guidelines um, this past year. And they do incorporate some of these uh, therapies. They um, specifically talk about using um, teotropium um, at, uh, at step five um, and maybe considering it as an add-on at step four. And then for step five therapy, you know, they talk about using biologics. Um, now, one thing that they do is uh, for reliever, you can see they recommend using a low-dose ICS and uh, long-acting beta agonist, um, and that's not approved by the FDA for use here. So we will stick to our short-acting beta agonists for, uh, for reliever medications. Um, regardless, though, you know, I think you'll see that in future uh, iterations of the NHL, um, in the NHLBI guidelines, you'll start to see these, these therapies uh, incorporated. Um, and again, you can see here, you know, it talks about the specific patients that they might be uh, useful for. So the main take-home points of my talk today, you know, Personalized therapy in asthma really requires a multifaceted approach. It's not just about, you know, throwing medications it's at families, but it's about really understanding, you know, the unique um, dynamics that each patient has um, socioeconomically um, in terms of, um, you know, where they, where they live and what exposures they, they have that might be worsening their, their um, burden of disease. Um, barriers to adherence and comorbidities must always be evaluated. In multidisciplinary intervention, you know, with asthma specialists such as pulmonology and allergy um, can be very, very useful in these um, difficult to treat cases. Um, and then, you know, therapy resistant asthma has an increasing number of options and increasingly this, these are based on unique patient phenotypes. And so, um, I just want to briefly acknowledge um, my division for their mentorship throughout my fellowship and, and continued um, uh, through now. Um, our clinic staff, a few key people are missing there, but um, for all the work that they do in our clinic. And then, of course, my lovely wife and um, my two uh, sweet, sweet girls um, for, all that, uh, for all that they do. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Scott, really great presentation. Um, thank you for that. You know, I thought I'd bring up a couple of things and see how you fit these into your sure. presentation this morning. One is the continued racial disparities in asthma, particularly here in Kentucky. So African-American patients uh, more than twice as likely to die from asthma. Right. Rates of asthma among African-Americans in Kentucky double what we see for racial major majorities. And I think that has really interesting implications for the exploration and development of personalized therapy and looking at phenotypes, genotypes, and factoring in things about race that even go into environment, comment number one. And then comment number two, I was really intrigued when you showed the four boxes of cluster analyses um, and how much allergy was a part of that, but thinking they 
those types of analyses really do need to incorporate exposure data. They so do. if you're allergic but you're not exposed to an allergen, I think your phenotype would be very, very different than if you were very predisposed and also highly exposed in your environment. So just an opportunity, I think, to improve those cluster analyses by not just looking at individual factors, but the environments that must certainly produce phenotype symptoms and outcomes. So if you could respond to those two things. Sure, be absolutely. Really so on the, first, on the first topic, you're absolutely right. You know, um, there is a racial disparity in asthma that I think has been, um, you know, well characterized and identified, um, and yet it persists. Um, you know, the cluster three and cluster four patients um, tend to have much higher rates of minorities, particularly the cluster four, um, those severe um, uh, patients with airflow limitations and so on, uh, tend to have very high rates of African Americans versus the other uh, less severe clusters. And so I think, you know, looking at some of these studies, for example, amalizumab um, was used, you know, in inner city uh, um, adolescents that had a high minority population and showed, you know, considerable de uh, decreases in, um, in the rate of exacerbations and rate of healthcare utilization. Um, I think that, you know, the, the challenge is going to be, um, is always, you know, having um, very close, uh, um, um, consistent follow-up um, so that they can be evaluated and, um, you know, seeing, seeing if some of these therapies would, would be um, applicable and helpful. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of barriers in that community um, to, to sometimes um, follow up in close care. But you can see not only in that study, but in the Pheno study, that even if you just apply, you know, guideline-based therapy in a rigorous manner, um, patients, you know, in these populations improve dramatically. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, outreach, uh, um, you know, improving our ability to, to outreach these patients with home visits and nursing follow-ups and things like that. I think all of these play a role. Um, you know, in, with regards to the cluster analyses, you're right, you know, it, they did not take into account what specific exposures there were. The other exposures that I was interest, interested in that wasn't addressed is how many of those were, you know, had smoke exposure at home, irritant exposure, and that's, those were not variables in that analysis. And so I, I agree, I think that's, a, that's something that can be approved upon in the future. Quick question, Scott. Thank you. Um, a lot of childhood asthma exacerbations also seem to be associated with viral upper respiratory, yes. especially now rhinovirus. Does that play a role in the clustering, or do those kids with that sort of phenotype, are those in an atopic group? Um, it seemed like, um, you know, it seemed like there was, um, you know, if you look, all, uh, all four of those clusters had fairly high rates of exacerbations. And we know that you know, like you said, in kids, most of these exacerbations are, you know, oftentimes have a viral trigger to them. And so I think that um, there was not, to my knowledge, one cluster that was, you know, um, I guess more prone than the others to viral, um, uh, viral induced exacerbations, except for the fact that, you know, obviously the cluster four patients did seem to have much more severe reactions in general. And so, you know, you can kind of extrapolate that to if they get rhinovirus or so on, they're the ones that are going to wind up in the ICU and so on. Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.